Our next speaker has served in various command and staff positions to include Commander, 3rd Brigade Combat Team, 101st Airborne Division, and Deputy Commanding General of the 3rd Infantry Division. He currently serves as the Commandant of the United States Army Infantry School and the Director of the Soldier Lethality Cross-Functional Team. It's my pleasure to introduce Brigadier General Larry Burris. Thanks, Brent. Well, hey, good morning. I'm Brigadier General Larry Burris. I have the privilege of serving as the Infantry Commandant and the Director of the Soldier Lethality Cross-Functional Team here at Fort Benning. It is in that capacity as CFT Director that I welcome you this morning and I invite you to join me in welcoming Major General Ross Kaufman, the Director of the Next Generation Combat Vehicle Cross-Functional Team. Together, we represent Army Futures Command and our efforts to modernize the maneuver force. But before we talk about those efforts, Let's take a look back at what brought us to this point. In 2018, we realized we have a, had a problem. The fundamental, I'm like breathing heavy here. The fundamental problem of erosion in our close combat capabilities relative to the pacing threats, as identified in the National Defense Strategy. While we were focused on the Middle East for two decades, our global competitors were making great strides in the employment of advanced technologies, adapting and harnessing them for their militaries. The National Defense Strategy revealed in 2018 that our near-peer threats have capabilities that match or exceed ours. At that time, they could detect, target, and engage lethally before U.S. forces became aware of their presence. In areas where we had long enjoyed a great gap in overmatch, we can't even claim parity. In order to restore overmatch quickly and sustain it in the future, we must we, we realize we must anticipate the implications of new technologies on the battlefield and foster a culture of experimentation. We must be willing to take calculated risks. We must be willing to, to move quickly. Enter Army Futures Command in the advent of the cross-functional team concept and 31 focused and targeted signature modernization efforts. It is the responsibility of the soldier lethality cross-functional team to spotlight and accelerate those modernization efforts that enhance the lethality and effectiveness of the close combat force. When I say close combat, the infantry immediately comes to mind, of course. But we're also talking about scouts, combat medics, forward observers, combat engineers, and special operations forces. Historically, these five MOSs bore the brunt of casualties in combat. Close combat is characterized, close combat is warfare characterized by brutal physical confrontation. The CCF designation identifies those positions and the brigade combat team that are truly the tip of the spear, those who close with and destroy our adversaries. The focus on the close combat force is, more about, more, is about more than equipping the force. It's about increasing training resources and many priorities to those designated positions. The Spartan Creed say it's, says, he who sweats more in training bleeds less in war. The close combat force makes up 4% of the military, but since World War II have sustained 90% of the casualties and they receive less than 4% of the DOD budget for science and technology. So what are we doing differently to restore overmatch and increase the lethality and survivability of our close combat force? What are we doing to ensure the weapon systems we're developing here at the CFT will be acceptable to the soldier in the field and practical and preferable to legacy systems in combat? For starters, we institutionalized the practice of soldier center design. I'm sure that's not a new concept to most of you, though, mo most, though you may, might have heard it labeled something else. The idea isn't new, but how we baked it into the process is. Literally, from day one, soldiers are involved in every step of the process, from design to development to maturation. Let me use IVAS for example, and we'll talk more about where we are with that program in a moment. On day one, before we even had a basic prototype, our partners at Microsoft and PEO Soldier brought soldiers in to help sh shape crude blocks of styrofoam into, a, into the design that soldiers wanted. And then as we developed one prototype over, after the other and added the technologies that make IVAS truly a leap ahead capability, we brought them back time after time. They told us how to shape it, how to configure all the buttons. They put it on their heads and wore it into the field where they put it to the test and then they critiqued it. This happened over and over. In the past three years, thousands of soldiers have invested tens of thousands of hours in forming our progress. The most obvious example of this is the enhanced night vision goggle binocular. We inherited this requirement when the CFT stood up in 2018, and we fielded 
the EMVGB to the first unit in the fall of 2019. It is the best night vision device in the Army today. Not only did we break new ground when we developed and fielded the device in less than half the time of traditional processes, we were also the first to reach the transition milestone. In September, we transitioned EMVGB to Soldier, Re Soldier Readiness Division, where it will continue to be matured as one of the signature modernization efforts. But across the Army, soldiers are using EMVGB today. Now, the Integrated Visual Augmentation System, or IVAS, arguably one of the most notable signature modernization efforts for a variety of reasons. Our non-traditional partnership with Microsoft is noteworthy. You could call it groundbreaking. The suite of capabilities unlike, is unlike anything our soldiers have seen before. IVAS is first and foremost a fighting goggle. We like to say fight, rehearse, train in that order. But what's most significant is that it is a single device that harnesses all of these capabilities in one system to give elements of our close combat soldiers a fighting system that will make them more lethal, more aware, more mobile, and more survivable on the battlefield. It's worth noting again that we're years ahead of where we would be if we, if we were developing this system as we have done historically. Much has been made of the fact that the Army made the wise decision to schedule the operational test for the spring instead of last October. The program was always designed to respond to soldier feedback. Soldier-centered design means we listen to our primary stakeholders, the soldiers, and we were willing to reevaluate and renegotiate our timeline to ensure the system is mature and combat ready. That decision is already paying dividends. We improved the clarity, consistency, and reliability. We added new features to enhance warfighter functions. Feedback from more recent testing proves soldiers are pleased with the advances. Our third signature modernization effort is Next Generation Squad Weapons Program, which includes the two weapons, the rifle and the automatic rifle, 6.8 millimeter ammunition, and fire control. The Next Generation Rifle, the XM5, will replace the M4 and the M4A1. The Next Generation Automatic Rifle, the XM250, will replace the M249 Squad Automatic Weapon. Both weapons will use a government-provided 6.8 millimeter caliber ammunition being developed as part of the program. You've likely read a lot about it in the news lately because just last month we awarded the contract for next generation fire control, the XM-157, to Vortex Optics. The next generation weapons program is a middle tier acquisition rapid fielding program. We've conducted more than 18 soldier touch points and we could not, couldn't subscribe to soldier center design without soldier touch points. We'll select a vendor and award a, con a weapons contract in the next couple of months. This program capitalizes on advancing technologies to provide increased performance at range, integrated squad fire control, improved ergonomics, lightweight case ammunition technologies, and signature suppression capabilities. The weapons are lightweight and mitigate recoil. They have integrated muzzle sound and flash reduction, and they maintain overmatch against near-peer adversaries. Before I move on to talk about what's ahead, I want to take a minute to talk about the lessons we've learned in the last three or four years as we've navigated strange waters. In every instance, we found the specific specifications we started with were not the ones we needed to deliver to the close combat force. It's important to pursue outcomes, not KPPs. We listen to the customer, and that's vital. If there's one thing that is key to success, if I had to drill it down to one single thing, it's this, iterate. As often as possible, get that system in the hands of soldiers and let them try it and test it. The initial concept is the right solution about 10% of the time. That's the essence of soldier-centered design. It works. Use dedicated researchers and testers to validate soldier needs and establish a disciplined feedback model to rapidly influence designs and outcomes, measure sentiment, and evaluate. Then we pause after each touch point for a time to conduct detailed assessment and planning. Team IVAS, for example, takes about three to five weeks after each touch point to conduct a joint detailed planning session with our partners and stakeholders before entering the next phase of prototyping. Having decided to move the operational test to the spring gave the, time, <clears throat> gave the time to refine specific capabilities, and we will deliver the system to the field in less, ha less than half the time a traditional acquisition process has historically taken. And we do this with complete confidence. This is the system soldiers want because they designed it. Now let's talk about what, what's ahead. As I mentioned earlier, we transitioned EMGB to MC in September which allows us to look to the future and consider future efforts. We're working with the science and technology community for insights and understanding the emerging technologies that will have implications on the battlefield. 
The science and technology work that enables our emerging technologies reside within our late lines of effort as laid out in our initial capabilities document. These lines of effort are lethality, situational awareness, survivability, training in human performance, mobility, communication, and protection. The MC did Soldier Readiness Division is leading the Platoon Armaments Ammunition Configuration Study, the PAC study, to gain a better understanding of the lethality gaps at the platoon level. Among other things, the PAC study will inform Army senior leaders regarding potential courses of action concerning the future focus of modernization efforts. These kinds of studies are important because they inform the potential trades, trades that must take place between the illities and for the soldier lethality CFT, that's mainly lethality and mobility to strike a balance that best serves our soldiers. We're supporting this study in a limited ca capacity and looking at this with great interest as we consider our options down the road. Before I close, I want to I want to offer an opportunity. So from 1,200 to 1,400 today and tomorrow, all of the signature uh, systems are located up in the Doughboy room, and we've got Matt Walker and Lieutenant Colonel Josh Powers up there, who'd be happy to talk to you and get you some hands on some of the systems. We've got all three variants of the IVAS up there, so you can see how where it's progressed from EV1 to EV3. And so I invite all of you to come up. Thank you all for what you do for our service members and the opportunity to participate today. Now I'll turn the stage over to Major General Ross Kaufman, the Director of the Next Generation Combat Vehicle CFT. Hey, thanks, Larry. All right, Maneuver Warfighter Conference. Thanks for putting this on. Really appreciate it. You know, we've done a lot of these virtual experiences, and when the, when the speakers are distributed and the audience is distributed, it's, I mean, I think twice as hard. So this is, it's, although not optimal, I think this is the best thing that, that we could have done. I told someone, they, I was speaking here today, and they said, well, who, who's in the room? I said, well, it's only about 40 people. And they said, well, that sounds, that's not so bad. And I go, no, it's like the most skeptical group that you could ever assemble uh, speaking to. But I, I'm happy to be here today. We're going to talk, uh, really, it's, we're bringing together two groups, right? It's the mechanized formations and the light formations, one of which is fueled and motivated by the smell of cordite, cherry deuce, and uh, to be honest, circular glazed pastries. The other is generally motivated by three things, water, ammunition, and hate. So as we come together, I think one thing that really unites us is modernization. And it's done in the same way and with the same purpose to fight and win on the battlefield. You know, you've got... Army Futures Command has been in existence for about three and a half years. And in those three and a half years, we've learned a lot. We learned that we require a demand signal from you. And that demand signal is based on, I think, the basic notion that we can't modernize to parity. We must modernize to overmatch. And how can you do that? How can you help? Well. There's obviously ONS, but what's in your USR? What are the comments in your USRs at Echelon that necessitate modernization? And if you could take a look at that, I think that would be very, very helpful. You know, as the current events tell us, and that was, you know, the video that was up on the screen that Pat played um, showed a 10-foot tall enemy. And I don't think they're 10 feet tall, but I don't think they're 2 feet tall either. So we need to have the right mix and the right balance of capabilities across echelons to defeat that. Because while General McKean talked about sustainment and some challenges, they're going to have the same challenges. They do not attack us with free will and unencumbered by the effects of our weapon system. So. This is a balance of what we need to modernize, what we need to focus on and train on at home station. Been in this job three and a half years and there's some certain things I've learned. Had plenty of failures to learn from. Are we modernizing platforms or are we modernizing formations? And that's very, very hard, both of which are suboptimal. But you can't afford both. You can't afford to have an exquisite suite on every vehicle that does everything, and a formation that has trade spaces uh, between those capabilities. So you have to choose. 
I've learned that we're not omniscient, and we never have been. We've fooled ourselves year in and year out through the requirements process, through the acquisition process, and we thought that at the beginning of a program, we could set a requirement that would withstand the next 10 years, seven years to get that equipment in the field. So how do you turn that on its head? Well, the first model that you field has to be better than what you have. It has to be, or why are we spending the money? But you don't need every capability. You can put those in version one, version two, version three, and spread that out so that as technology matures, you have the hooks in this to constantly stay ahead of your enemy. And one thing that we're trying to do in the vehicle space is the first fielded equipment should not look like the third unit that gets it, right? Every three years, you should be able to spin in new technologies and continue to iterate so that you can go back and re retrofit the initial vehicles much cheaper than waiting for it all to be ready on schedule and time, and you can continually upgrade. I learned that our traditional victory architecture that we've talked about in the vehicle fleets for so many years had one caveat at the end of it. And the caveat was, if you can't meet victory, just tell us. That's no longer acceptable. And I don't know if you know General Glenn Dean or uh, Colonel Jeff Durand, but they are absolutely flipping the switch on modular open system architecture. And they have, the, the concept here is that industry owned the IP for everything on the vehicle. And in order to in, introduce a new technology onto an existing vehicle, you had to pay the OEM extra money even if that technology didn't come from them because they own the interface. That's no longer going to be the case. Think of the USB port for your sensor. And that allows us for small and medium-sized companies to come with very innovative technology that they don't want to share that IP, and I don't want to pay for the IP. But all they have to do is make sure that that IP interfaces with the vehicle system, and those standards are defined, and that allows us to recompete weapons, sensors, mobilities, engines, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So that modular system open architecture is key. The next thing I learned is that for the last, well, forever, we didn't do digital engineering in the Army vehicle programs. I, I don't know how that's possible, but we didn't. And so, again, Glenn Dean, Jeff Duran have absolutely flipped the switch, and it allows you to do things that you wouldn't realize. So in the old way of doing things, you would have hundreds of meetings with the uh, vendors to determine you know, just infinite detail into their CAD models. With digital engineering, you can just click a button and do it yourself. You don't have to have a meeting for that. They're providing you the information. You can get your, your answers very, very quickly. It's new. It's, uh, it's an industry standard. The Air Force and the Navy have moved in this direction. And again, the PEO and his PM team are taking us into a space that we'll, we'll never look back from. Very, very impressive. I learned that contracting is very, very hard and changing of how we write contracts and the language that we put in there to allow us to be in the driver's seat on a continual basis is not the norm, right? The iterative nature of the contracts and if you talk to contracting command and their new commanding general, she's on it. I mean, just moving forward in that direction to change the way so that the government is in control of the IP that it needs, government, government purpose rights, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And so you've got a team that goes beyond just Army Futures Command. You've got the ASALT, you have uh, the ACC, Army Contracting Command. Everyone's moving differently. And I think that the, what you're going to see is, as a taxpayer, a benefit, and as a soldier, a benefit. 
And the last thing that uh, really slaps me in the face that I learned is it's all about trades. And in the past programs, we wanted it all. And you have to make hard decisions. Let's talk about survivability for one. In a current vehicle under, body, under blast protection, you have to have sufficient space between the top of your soldier's head and the top of the roof in order to, for that soldier in an underbody blast to survive and not break her or his neck. Well, what's that add? That adds probably about two points, about two and a half inches. Okay, and you start stacking that up with the distance from the ground so it allows you to, have, to withstand the blast that you desire. Now you're at another four inches. And so now you're looking at these vehicles and you say, well, why are they so tall? because we're not willing to sacrifice our soldiers' lives under an underbody blast protection. So now that starts as a baseline. So what else can you do? Well, we can trade it, it can squat, right? And so there's options here. But everything has a cost. And if you want to be able to take the latest Russian ammunition at a 90 degree angle into the side of your vehicle, you're gonna need so much armor or you're gonna need some active protection system which adds weight. So why do they weigh so much? Well, because there's trades to make. And when you start it, that's survivability. Now you take lethality. How many still kills do you want? How many vehicles and people do you want that single platform or the formation to kill in a given day? Because we will always fight outnumbered. And so that takes more interior space. And so there's trades and trades and trades, and it becomes hard decisions. And who gets to make those hard decisions? The chief of staff of the army on the requirement side. Right? And so we have to present that out as, okay, this is what we think are acceptable trades to make on how many people are in the back, what a weapons caliber, what, what type of punch are you willing to take, 360, and what sensor packages do you want on this? So let's talk real quick about a couple programs. The optionally manned fighting vehicle, the replacement for the Bradley. We didn't give any requirements. Zero. We started with nine broad characteristics and said, okay, industry, I want you to iterate and innovate and to give us what your design is. Those broad characteristics had some limitations in them, like you have to be able to drive across 80% of the bridges in the areas where we are most likely to fight. So there's a range. Well, that's not giving them a specific weight. They can change the pounds per square inch of the track pads by making it wider, longer, more road wheels, less road wheels. There's options. And so, those broad characteristics cover survivability, lethality, training, they, they go down the list. But it gives very broad parameters for industry to iterate on. Next, they brought their initial designs and we had soldiers, much like Larry was saying, go in there one-on-one. -on -one. And because we've already awarded the contract to five in individual companies, we can give that company direct feedback Whereas normally in a competition, if I give this company feedback, I have to share it with everyone, which doesn't allow them to maintain their proprietary information. And so we're able to give direct feedback, iterate with them over a series of these digital designing exercises, which allows them to get better and us to get better. Then we bring soldiers in and, and they put them in a simulated crew compartment. And they look at switchology and space and why is this button here? And the soldiers provide that feedback and it gives them options. So that, that's very, very, I, I think, the right direction and we've seen positive results. The next is we've, we've agreed that we will make no decision before it's time. Glenn Dean and I have agreed no programmatic decisions and no requirements decisions before it's time because Again, we're not omniscient, we're learning, we're informing requirements, we're informing requirements, and then budgets change, things like this. So you're not 
locking yourself in to a schedule that may be unattainium. You're not locking yourselves in to requirements that may never come to fruition, and then you have to make even harder choices. The, the next thing is draft documents. So we would, previously we would write a, a requirements document and we would hold it to the last minute and then hand it to industry and say, okay, here's, here, this is, it's perfect. We iterate with industry because they'll see things with their engineering that we may have missed. That if, if you want your thermal signature to be at this level, you're forcing me to put additional weight or design or increased cost. Is that what you want to do? And then we can take that to the chief and say, look, this is, this is kind of the trade space. Um, and then just where we are in the program, we have five vendors on contract right now doing digital designs with us. At the end of this month, we're going to drop the draft RFP or request for proposal, which goes out to industry requesting them to bid a contract. That's a full and open competition, so we could get five or more people bidding on this contract. From that, they'll down to select to three. Those three will take it all the way to building prototypes. And from there, the source selection board will select one. Next, robotic combat vehicle. This is something I learned. I, I kind of, my first year I was enamored by the vehicle, the robot, and how, you know, that's amazing. Look at that robot. That's the easiest damn thing we do. Anybody can build a robot. All it is is a drive-by-wire uh, vehicle. It's not hard. I couldn't do it, but it's not hard. So what is, what makes up this program? What makes up a robot? Well, the user interface. What does that look like? And are we going to have a different user interface software for that little tiny helicopter you saw on the screen, a, a gray eagle, a small ground robot that goes out and disarms mines? No. Okay, we got to standardize the software package so that we're not paying for it over and over again and that it's government owned. Okay, so that's first, the user interface. Then how does the user speak to the robot? Well, now you need some form of radio or transport layer. And physics gets in the way. So if you're talking a line of sight radio, which is necessary because of the, you can't have latency like in the air. Okay, you know how like your gray eagles, they can fly or your predators can fly all the way from Vegas. Well, when they land, they transition that control the terminal control of that aircraft to a ground station has direct line of sight because you have zero latency opportunities when you're landing that aircraft. So if they have to crab it in, if they have to change course, it's immediate. When you're dealing with a, ro a ground robot that has a weapon on it and is dealing with like very dynamic terrain coming at it constantly, you can't afford high latency. So you need anywhere between 10 and 40 megabits per second, and now physics gets in the way. On flat ground, you have one range, and I won't talk about it just because we've been able to triple what we thought we could do through some innovative uh, radio solutions from industry. But you have one range, but then when you put it in woods, it's less, and when you put it in urban, it can be less or more, depending on the situation. But so you have a radio there, you got a radio on the, on the robot. Now you have a payload. These are all built payload agnostic. So is it an engineer? type vehicle with a Miklik and a scoop? Is it a sensor package? Is it a weapons package? You know, is it an EW package? Is it a deception package? What's on there? And there, that, that part is frankly the easiest for all of us to ascertain. If you can put it on a regular vehicle, if you can do it, putting it on a robot, it's done. Easy. Um, and then the thing I, I'm most proud of Miles Brown's team for is called the Robotic Technology Kernel, RTK. The government owns it. And the RTK is the autonomy package that allows, it's like the flux capacitor, right? It's the, it allows time travel to be possible. But uh, autonomy, the state of autonomy today 
if you went anywhere in, the, in a modern country, they could tele up just like you did your remote control cars as a kid. They could put in waypoints, and that vehicle could travel to those waypoints, and they could avoid obstacles. That's not hard. Okay, th those problems have been solved. But if you think about your vehicle commanders at the rank of staff sergeant, we've trained them for years how to take that vehicle and see the terrain and have perception that we don't want to skyline ourselves, we don't want to have our underbelly shown to the enemy because that's where we're weakest. We want to move like water. Bruce Lee. Training in a, a, an autonomy system to do that is very, very hard, the perception. And if you want to train them to do that with computer vision rather than LIDAR, which is a signature that the enemy can detect, it's even harder. And then if you want to do that at night, it becomes even more difficult. I am very confident with the state of autonomy that we have in the robots today, that we're demonstrating right now in Aberdeen, that it would expand the battlefield, it would give commanders decision space, it would give dilemmas to the enemy that they had never seen before. I'm happy with the MVP that we have, the minimal viable product, but it's not good enough for 2030. It's just not. But I often ask by people, well, I'm, I'm, a, I'm not a fan of robots. I said, OK, well, if you were in the defense, would you take a robot and put it 10 kilometers in front of you and allow it to sense the enemy coming towards you and then, uh, depending on what you want to do, you know, engage them to make them deploy early? Oh, yeah, that sounds great. Then you're a fan of robots. Welcome to the team. OK. And, uh, the last thing on robots is human in the loop always. Human in the loop always. Uh, and then my closing comment is, I think that we'll have, ro we'll have machines. And it's been alluded to a couple times by both uh, Don Sando and General McKean. That will detect, identify enemy forces. We can do that today. Okay? It's hard, and it's not scalable yet, but we've proven it. You can detect and identify enemy forces. And so it's not too big of a leap to think that you could slew a weapon system there, and that a commander on a vehicle could look and say, yes, that's a target, and I want to engage it and hit a button and then go on about doing what she or he was going to do anyway. So you think of those crew duties that was just reduced. I, I am, I'm choosing my words carefully. I, I am 100% confident that that's possible. It's, do we want that? That's the question. I know you want the human in the loop. Is the algorithmic solution that you have sufficient? Do you have the confidence in it, et cetera? And uh, as I talk to people about what you want from an AI solution. You want a spot report, because you can call for fire off a spot report. You can orient fire, direct fire from a spot report. You can smoke a spot report. I mean, there, there's lots of things to do. But the standard information you'd have in a spot report plus one thing, and that's confidence. And our AI algorithms can give us, I am 80% confident that that's a T-72. And then it's up to you as a commander. So from phase line red to phase line blue, I want you to engage anything with a 95% or higher confidence rate that that's an enemy vehicle based on the rules of engagement that have been given to me by my hire. But beyond phase line blue, where I get into a populated area, I require 100% confidence. And is that human in the loop? So think about how you would play that out. So. In closing, thanks again, Pat, for having us. And uh, if, you, if you're interested in MPF, Amp V, you know, what comes after Abrams, we can talk about that in question and answer. But uh, I appreciate your time. Thank you. Thanks, sir. Thank you, gentlemen. We have about five minutes for questions, so I'll start off. 
Uh, how do each of you envision the close combat forces changing and adapting to achieve the objectives of multi-domain operations? Sir, I'll start with you. Okay, one minute or less. Multi-domain operations is going to expand the battlefield as we've talked about. One thing we did not talk about is in multi-domain operations in the year 2030, the assets that are required to make decisions faster and, and affect others faster uh, are become, will become more prevalent. We'll have more satellites, we'll have more sensors, we'll be able to aggregate that information. And now the question becomes, what access and authorities do you give at Echelon? So it, can you envision at some point a battalion commander having the authority to call in an offensive cyber attack, which now is, is currently retained at our highest level. Uh, the expansion of the battlefield is going to create more info. It's not just how to apply fires. It's not just how to m expand your formations. Frankly, I think that's the easiest part of this. But when you talk about the MDO battlefield, it's the amount of information that now you have, because you have so much more battle space that the information is going to overwhelm a commander and her, his staff, very, very quickly. See, when we, we identify a, a uh, sit temp, we plan everything off of dotted lines. And then when those dotted lines are filled in, the staff is supposed to go back and re do some analysis and see if our base course of action is still on track. But we're horrible at that. Because everything's happening around us and there's, you know, we're reacting, reacting, reacting. A machine can do that. A machine can run a digital twin in the background to determine if your base course of action is on track or not. And then re make recommendations with a small GUI, red, amber, green light that says, your base course of action is on track. You might want to think about it. Cease fire. Something has changed to the extent that you need to go back and replan. That's the effect I think it's going to have. Larry? I think that, um, you know, when we think about the close combat force, you know, I, I'll give you an example. So the capabilities that General Kaufman talked about at PC-21, we demonstrated at Yuma that a lieutenant, a paratrooper from the 82nd Airborne Division can control a Gray Eagle from his or her ATAC and execute a Hellfire strike. And so it goes back to what are the authorities' capabilities that we want to push down at Echelon, like General Kaufman said, to make them more lethal, to enable them to accomplish their mission. And so those are the things we're trying to get after, but there's lots of capabilities. With, with IVAS, for example, we've been able to put um, wireless tactical routers into aircraft and put system-optimized augmented reality or cameras on the belly of FVL sur surrogates. And soldiers have been able to pass changes to the orders, changes to the graphics between aircraft, um, they've been able to see the LZ, so you change the LZ, they're able to see the, the new LZ through, through the, the, the IVAS via the camera. We've done a lot of this with strikers, so think in a striker, soldier sitting in the back, and he or she does not see the armor. He or she only sees what is going on outside of the vehicle, which enables them to maintain situational awareness so that when the ramp drops, they know what's out there. We've done it with the Bradley as well in terms of being able to tie it into the CITV, uh, the gunner's DVE, and also the gunner's site, so that although not ideal, able to see around the entire vehicle, they're at least able to have some situational awareness um, as, they, as they get ready to, to exit the vehicle. And so I think there's a lot of ways that we can combine, particularly with FVL and uh, NGCV, to make sure our, our soldiers have a couple things. Number one, power, right? Because everything that we put on them requires power, right? Next gen weapon, IVAS, EMVGB. Net Warrior, all of it takes power. Data, right? Passing information back and forth amongst the organizations and the soldiers, but more importantly, maintaining situational awareness for the dismounted soldier that's coming off the aircraft or out of the back of the vehicle. We have a time for one more question. Yes, sir. I didn't hear the first part, Steve, say. Yeah. Oh, hey, thanks. Uh, Ross, you made the statement about requiring a human in the loop uh, towards the end of your, your discussion there. It, have we defined that as a requirement from an army? It's policy. Okay. It's DOD policy. Yeah. You cannot, 
You cannot apply lethal effects without a human in the loop. Okay. Off a, ro off of a robotic combat vehicle or a robotic vehicle. Okay. It, well, lethal effects. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I, I mean, because I, I, I appreciate the clarification because when it's stated as, you know, in general, because there's a lot of things with robotics that doesn't necessarily equate to a lethal effect and that we don't necessarily need a human in the loop for. Um, I think that's fair. I, I mean, I think if you're talking about degradation of networks, jamming, deception, uh, I'd have to go back and reread the policy to make sure that I, I'm straight on that. But I know for sure lethal effects is, is one that you, you cannot execute without a human's decision. Yeah. Okay. All right. No, I appreciate it. There's probably a lot more discussion on that. Yeah. Thank you, gentlemen.